I think everybody spends some time thinking about whether their life is being led as well as they wanted to. Should they have done something different career-wise, relationship-wise, in terms of their ethics, how they spent their money, donated their time, uh, how serious they were, how fun-loving to be, how much school to have, uh, how much drugs to use or not use. Uh, and it's a it's a certainly a problem that uh, it's an issue that especially as we get older we face ever more. And um, so what I'm planning to do here on this edition of How to Do Life is uh, share my own random thoughts. And again, this is an experiment I've been doing here on this show because it's a small NPR station in San Francisco rather than a, you know, some big one. I can afford to take more risks. So. I'm trying this experiment where I'm just going to say what comes to mind so you can experience, for better or worse, my thought process as I'm going rather than some nice sanitized little speech. So uh, I, it's easiest for me to talk about myself, so I'll start there. But then I've got four composite letters from four different people who are questioning how well they're living their life that I will read to you and give you my reactions. But first, my, my honest thoughts about how to live the life well led. I hate rules, and I think too many people live life following the rules. Everything from as trivial as stopping at stop signs at 2 in the morning when there's obviously no car around, to uh, following the conventional wisdom about uh, how we dress, or what we politically believe, or uh, uh, you know that we're supposed to be fun-centric. There's, you know, in certain different countries, I, notably they say that in Europe, people tend to be more serious. Here, we have a real primacy on being fun. Not necessarily, you know, super silly, I'm not saying that, but where people enjoy partying and going out drinking or vaping or whatever you're doing, uh, dancing, uh, you know, having fun. Uh, I don't, you know, just this personal expression of my own beliefs is that you know, every minute I spend working, and right now, for example, it's 10 p.m. here, I'm recording this, um, after I've worked since 8 in the morning. So that's 14 hours later. And I could have much more fun watching Netflix, playing with my dog, taking a hike and just, you know, a walk, just vegging out. And yet I feel like my life is better if I'm spending it here doing my best to be of value to you. Um, I'm also, I think, what helps... My definition of a, a life well led is I really try to make the most. This is going to sound crazy, and feel free to dismiss me, or if you, you know, just turn this this podcast, or if you watch me on YouTube, find something else. But I try to make the most of every second. Uh, even in planning this show, I could spend hours scripting it, and yet I don't feel it's as good a use of my time. And as well, it, there is some advantage to my just simply doing this off the cuff as I'm doing it. So you. It's, it's very authentic and not and not at all sanitized. So I'm think I, I try to make the most of every second from everything from how I make breakfast and you know my meals to how I uh, work efficiently with clients. I send them a, 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 a very probing new client questionnaire in advance and I review that so that we can in session one accomplish a lot more than if we start from scratch just without that probing questionnaire to. Uh, multitasking when I when I walk my dog. I'm always bringing a thorny problem to think about in my little memo pad. And um, we're both getting our exercise. The dog gets to relieve himself, and I, I end up at Trader Joe's buying stuff. You know, uh, so um, I'm, I think the word is obsessed is fair to, to multitask. And that, to me, enhances the meaning of my life. Uh, I wish I could say I didn't rush, because by my being so rushed in type A, I'm suspect it's shortening my life, although I've already made it to 70, which is more than I thought I would. But I think being aware of mortality, which is something I have my entire life, has made me very focused on doing, making the most of every minute. And that means usually using my best skills, which are writing or thinking on my feet like this. This is as good as I get. If you don't like this, you won't like the rest of me. Um, and... Um, you know, and doing as, you know, to, to make the biggest difference I can in a way that somebody else might not. So, for example, I'm a career counselor who uh, tends to work with people who are, you know, I don't know how else to say it, but high IQs. 
because I like to think that that's a distinct niche that maybe I can better serve than maybe other people can. And I spend as much time doing that as possible and creating these YouTube videos and writing my articles. Uh, I really don't care very much about work-life balance at all. That's, that's me and my meaning of life. But I think now enough about me. And now let me turn to these four letters. These are composite letters. They a composite means they're they're the distillation. Of, I've had over six, almost six thousand clients. It's a distillation of what people have said and asked about related to uh, you know how to how to live life well. And so I'm going to read you these composite letters one at a time, and then I'm going to give you my honest reactions to uh, to what they're saying, asking about in the letter. Dear Dr. Nemco, with almost eight billion people on the planet plus billions more who preceded me and billions more to follow me, I feel insignificant. Yes, I can be nice to people. Yes, I can do well at work. But it feels unimportant. It makes me want to be selfish, even occasionally mean. Do you have any ideas on how I might restore the think globally, act locally mindset that I used to live by? And here's my response. Yeah. Very few people end up significantly benefiting the planet. But could you accept that your life is worthy enough, at least, by recognizing that every time you're kind or you give tough love as is appropriate, which is not, it's not always wise to be kind or to be tough, but as appropriate, every time you're doing the right thing and being kind or maybe some direct, honest feedback, that improves someone's life and in turn other people's lives. You know, when you say, let's say you give criticism to somebody that they're long-winded, if they can indeed change, that's going to affect how they interact with lots of people and thereby indirectly improve lots of people's lives. Um, another example, every, you know, every, every time you're, you're working on something productive, you're doing a bit of good. Even if it's as absolutely trivial as picking up an empty Doritos bag that someone tossed onto the street. And maybe it might help you with moving forward. Think, imagine yourself on your deathbed. You know, might you feel better about how you lived your life if you had tried, even if imperfectly, to follow that adage you said you were using of think globally, act locally, and, and, and who knows? Maybe your wise act will create a legacy. Of course, there's the obvious ways to create legacy. You're being a good mentor, a good parent, a good lover, a, a good donor to causes, you know, invent something, but... Even consider that trivial example of picking up that empty Doritos bag off the street. You do things like that frequently, and the chances then are good that someone at some point is going to see you, which could inspire them to do similar nice little things, and maybe even teach such, you know, the value of doing these little trivial random acts of kindness to, uh, to their kids. You know, individually, those don't mean a hell of a lot, but maybe it's also comforting to think that collectively, there are, of course, there are some nefarious people who just do whatever they can to be mean, a lot of them. But most people are in their own little ways doing little things to try to make the world a little better, make those in their sphere of influence a little better. And that can help you, even if your individual contribution is trivial, can make you feel you're part of something bigger that's making a bigger difference. Okay. Here is the next letter from somebody. Um, Dear Dr. Nemco, uh, although it requires 60 plus hours a week, I have a good job as a nonprofit executive. And even though I have to pay a ton of alimony, I can manage to afford a middle class lifestyle, a nice house, a nice car, nice clothes, vacations, even private school for my kids. But I'm still unhappy. Now what? So here is my response. Now, I would imagine that this person is totally sick of hearing, you can't buy your way to contentment. But would you have more meaning in your life if you did any of these things? Should you mentor someone? It doesn't have to be somebody older, somebody younger. It could be somebody older. It could be a peer. It could be a professional mentoring or a personal mentoring, like you know, maybe volunteering uh, at a school to mentor some kid who's troubled but high potential. Uh, should you take up a creative um, avocation? Like, should you write a blog about something you believe in? Should you, should you do art that's, that reflects uh, what you care about and believe in, you think that deserves more attention? Photographers are really good at coming up with, uh, looking at, at, at something in a way that most of us wouldn't notice, but it, it captures that and helps 
the the world's experience it. Should you spend more time with a good friend or a romantic partner? Or maybe conversely, and this again is very counter to the mainstream culture, should you spend more time alone? There are some people who are just happiest and more contributory when they're alone. Uh, I'll be honest, that includes me. And, you know, it, there are other people who are always giving so much to other people that it feels good for them to take a little more time for themselves. The third letter that I want to read to you is uh, Dear Dr. Nemco, everyone tells me that I work too much, that I'm a workaholic, but I like work. I feel better and more useful when I'm working than when I'm playing. Am I fooling myself? Here's my response. If you do like work more than what you would otherwise be doing, family time, fun things, uh, whatever, you might want to ignore people's advice, for example, in the area of parenting. It really is true. I, you know, I think the data is pretty clear on this and logically true that quality time as a parent is more important than quantity time. If you take hours, say, oh, eight to 11 in the, in, in, during, during the, you know, you work your eight hours and there's that three hours that you could either work more or you could spend it with family. If in general, if you're doing work you're good at and is contributory, maybe making a few extra bucks, but you're, when you're after that 11 hours, I know you'll be tired, but if you then provide quality time for your kid, it is certainly arguable that the person who's choosing to spend hours eight to 11 doing their good work may be more rewarding, not only for them, but for the world than the person who spends hours eight to 11 with their kids, with their spouse, uh, you know, let alone uh, in fun, playing ball, watching video game, playing video games, uh, watching Netflix, uh, let alone getting high. Um, so, um, now I, I guess I do need to say that there are some people who are telling you, you're a workaholic, you should have more work-life balance because, and, and they want, they want you to work less, not because they really think that's necessarily in your best interest, but because maybe they dislike their job and they assume that you must also, because they all work, you know, or that most people hate their jobs, they'd rather play, but not, that's not necessarily true. Frankly, for the most successful people I know, uh, you know, and, and they don't have to be successful like as a brain researcher, they could be successful in a, uh, you know, a more modest role, but they enjoy, you know, being a, a brick bricklayer or a, uh, you know, or the, a, a salesperson or whatever. Uh, anyway, you know, that exhortation for work-life balance may indeed be appropriate for many people. But I really believe that that is a personal choice. You really need to do what you think is wise. You know, you only get, as they say, you only get one time around on this planet. And it's, you know, I'm not saying you just, you know, you're an anarchist and violate all principles that are of responsibility. But within those fairly wide bounds, uh, you really do need to live the life the way you want to. I should let you know you're, uh, you're listening to How to Do Life. I'm Marty Nemco. If you're listening to it on a podcast or broadcast on KSF, you know, if you're listening to it on, on radio or whatever, or on podcast, it's KSFP Public Radio 102.5 in San Francisco. And of course, uh, uh, I also welcome all of you who are uh, watching this on YouTube. Okay, I have one more uh, letter that I want to read to you that gives voice to somebody who has deep questions about the meaning of their life. This is an older person. Dear Dr. Nemco, I'm old and am feeling the cliched woulda, coulda, shoulda. I should have stayed with molecular biology and probably could have been a productive researcher. Instead, I became a fundraiser. Yes, I believe in the cause, but now at age 68, I'm looking back and wondering how much good I actually facilitated. How do I make peace with my life? And here is my response. Revisiting the past encourages self-recrimination, malaise, makes you more unhappy. Moving forward, what could you do differently? And here's an example. This person said that they wished that they had become a molecular biology researcher. I'll talk as though I'm talking to that person. Have you read up on the field? Maybe not in journals, which will be very hard to understand all that esoterica, but in the popular media, like 
Scientific American, or even easier to read and understand might be Discover magazine. And there's a lot of biomedical coverage in the news media. That might be a way to you know feel like you're 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 scratching that molecular biology uh, uh, itch, that scratching that itch. Or might you offer to volunteer? And I can't guarantee they would take you, but offer to volunteer at a university or at a pharmaceutical company's lab. There may often be uh, a need for another bottle washer. Now again, some pharmaceutical companies say no, our insurance doesn't allow it. I'm well aware of that. But there may be volunteer opportunities that even if you're 68 or 78, where another pair of hands, somebody do some filing, some organizing, you know, who knows? And maybe when you get there and you ask good questions and you read up on what they're currently working on, they may give you more and more responsibility, even, you know, if you're in supposedly seniorhood. Or might you want to take a course, for example, uh, a course on the molecular biology of COVID. There's one, for example, um, that's highly rated and it's free and it's three hours uh, long. An online course is being offered by Johns Hopkins. Uh, and the way you can find it is just, uh, crap, just put Johns Hopkins epidemiology, uh, go to Coursera.org and search on COVID-19 epidemiology. And I'm hoping that you'll find it. Okay, so now let's talk about what are there any generalizable takeaways across what I've just been given as a response to these four letters. Well, I think there are two. The first is to try, you know, and I want to start by saying it is infinitely easier for me to offer advice and to follow it. But if you're questioning your life, maybe these two principles or the specifics that I have previously mentioned could provide at least one baby step you want to take forward. So anyway, the first principle that I, I think maybe cut across most of these, uh, my responses to these letters is to try to take pleasure even in small moment to moment contribution. I used that example of Doritos to be honest, because I did that a couple of days ago and it somehow as silly as it sounds, it felt good. I felt like a good citizen. And I, and it wasn't something that I would have done, you know, when I was much younger, but I happened to visit Switzerland at some point a few years ago. And I saw that was routine. People had this communitarian spirit and people would just pick up trash off the street and put it in the trash. People always talk about how clean Switzerland is. That's it, it isn't a government mandate. It isn't anything there. It is in the culture of the Swiss people, apparently to, uh, you know, that you are part of the, your responsibility is to keep, you know, keep tidy, keep clean the streets around you. And uh, I, I took that to heart. Those small moment to moment contributions, they're, they're valuable in themselves, even as silly as that Doritos example. But it may be comforting to think that with the billions of people, there are like 8 billion people on the planet. And yeah, there's maybe, you know, some small percentage that is truly evil. They're not even trying to do good. But most people in their own limited ways, and we're all limited ways, are each trying in their way to do the right thing. And while our individual contribution may not make much difference, collectively, it may feel good to say that I am part of this collective effort that's helping the planet to, to take, you know, uh, to move forward. And probably collectively, significantly. I do like Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, which talks about that in Toto, while we still see the headlines constantly about, you know, violence and, uh, and all sorts of evil, uh, like they say, the, the news media likes to say, if it bleeds, it leads, meaning the lead story is if it's, you know, if there's death and mayhem involved, they, they lead with it. But um, in truth, as Pinker points out, the average lifespan worldwide is up. Uh, the amount of net violence is down. The amount of literacy is up. Uh, and so even if our individual efforts make trivial, if any difference, um, to be to be a part of this collective effort to improving the planet, I think should feel good. Uh, and the second thing is something I have said ad nauseum, but I said it ad nauseum because it's, it is what I believe more than anything else. Uh, and that is to focus less on looking back and more on taking baby steps forward. And I want to expand on that. I have seen 
so many clients career i'm a career counselor and personal coach and so they overlap you start with career and often it bleeds pardon the expression into uh, personal issues um but i've seen so many people who've had lots of psychotherapy and of course that pool of people could be more problemed to begin with but it seems to me as i listen to them talk they are still so mired in the past and they keep revisiting and revisiting hoping that you know they're somehow that's going to help them move forward and that is the the underpinning tenet of of at least classical traditional psychotherapy that if you process it and process it and process it that will help you move forward i can only say to you my dear viewers and listeners i have generally not found that to be the case with my clients the more they revisit and i've said this ad nauseum the more likely the memory neurons associated with that bad memory are top of mind which makes them more unhappy so if their parents ignored them or abused them or whatever the more you talk about it it's unlikely to help you move forward at least my clients have been far better off to stop looking back stop revisiting sure in the, you know one brief momentary revisit to see if there's any lessons learned it's that's great no problem but i'm talking about people who you know if I, six months later a year later sometimes 40 years later are still revisiting that iniquity that was perpetrated upon them by a spouse by an employer by parents by peers by a stranger um, yeah i guess the word beg is fair i would beg you to spend less time on that and more time figuring out what the next baby steps forward are and importantly to take those baby steps and the the best way I've been able to uh, drive this home, according to people telling me, this is the thing that they, they've they told me that over all these years, I've given a zillion talks, they say that it's amazing, more than, more than by far any other thing I've ever said, they remember my father's story. So I'm going to end, I've got extra time today, so I'm going to tell you the extended version of the story that people find the most enlightening as a way of motivating them to stop looking back and taking the next step forward. The year was 1939. The town was Sheriff's Poland. My father was living at home with his parents in a bucolic uh, setting. They never even locked the door. Uh, and one day there was a knock on the door and it was two Nazis in black boots. And unlike in the movies, one of them stayed silent and the other whispered and said, you will be out of your house, but only what you can carry on your back by noon tomorrow or else. And the next day there were not two Nazis, there were 12. And now, uh, but there were two trucks. And now they weren't whispering, they were yelling. And they yelled, Raus! And they, to all the Jewish households, Raus means get up. And they grabbed all the Jews and they took the really, uh, the really strong ones and put them in one truck. My dad was one. And then anybody who wasn't strong or was young or old got thrown in the other truck. And my father never saw his parents again. And he was one of the uh, roughly 50 men who dug a tunnel to escape from the Panari death camp, P-O-N-A-R-Y, you can uh, look it up. And uh, he lived in the Black Forest thanks to the good Christians who took care of him. And then at the end of the war, he was dropped on a cargo boat and dumped in the Bronx without a penny to his name, no money, as I said, no English, no education, no family, all the supposed linchpins of what are, or requirements to any success. What he did have was the scars of the Holocaust tortures. And what did he do? It was no job that was beneath him. His job was sewing shirts in a factory in Harlem. And uh, he worked 10 hours a day minimum wage. But because he didn't want to, he knew that if he didn't learn to speak good English, and believe me, Polish is very different than English, he would be consigned to a minimum wage or near minimum wage job the rest of his life. So at night, even though he was exhausted, even though he had every right to claim victimhood of the, of the years of the Holocaust tortures uh, and rested from his you know, childhood. Uh, he had no childhood. He was a teenager and he was taken away by the Nazis. He didn't go home and get drunk or go even to Holocaust remembrance meetings. He uh, went to Roosevelt High School night school to learn English. Uh, so that he could move forward. And that's, by the way, where he met my mom, who was also a Holocaust survivor who was in Auschwitz. And what did he do on Saturday? Did he say, I'm exhausted? I'm a victim? No. He went to the owner of the factory where he sewed the shirts during the week, and he says, 
can I buy these shirts uh, that I sold for you from a wholesale price and sell them on the streets for a little more money? And he bought them for a buck a piece. This was 1948. I uh, bought them for a buck, and then he sold them on the streets out of a cardboard box for a buck and a half. And what did he do with the money? Did he say, oh, you know, I've now deserved, I have a right to uh, spend it on some nice things? No. You see, my wife, my wife, my mom, my dad, and me, and my sister were living in a tenement in a very dangerous neighborhood in the Bronx. And he didn't, that we lived right underneath the elevated train that was roaring 24-7 in New York. The, ele- the trains run 24-7. And he didn't want us living there, both for the danger and because we couldn't sleep. And there was certainly no air conditioning. <laughs> it was a fourth floor walk-up, no air conditioning. Um, anyway, he wanted to save up to be able to get us out of there. So uh, he saved up until he could afford the first and last month's rent on the only store he could afford, 105 Moore Street in Brooklyn. If you Google it, you know Google Maps, and now you'll see it's still one of the worst neighborhoods of all. And the store was just you know, horrible on one side. There was a live chicken market that uh, you would smell of stale blood. On the other side was a Puerto Rican deli specializing in chicharrones. So the, the smell of the stale blood and the chicharrones merged in front of my father's little store. Uh, and it, this was a clothing store, quite the atmosphere for selling clothing. And the store was really, really small. So he had to store most of them, display most of the merchandise out on the street on folding tables. Um, but I said a very tough neighborhood, and so on the weekends when the kids weren't in school, they would run by and steal whole boxes of sunglasses and shirts and whatever. He couldn't afford a security guard, so when I was 13, uh, he had me be the security guard. And uh, uh, he did tell me, don't try to stop them, they're just going to beat you up. And I was a wimp then, like I'm a wimp now. And uh, But I tell you this part about the security guard, because it was what allowed for the most memorable moment of my life and the best lesson I've ever learned, and it's what I'm trying to pass on to you right here, and that's this. One day, business was slow. There was a parking meter in front of the store, and I remember my elbow on one side of the meter and my dad's on the other. And when you're 13, you stop being quite as narcissistic and egotistical, hopefully. And I said, Daddy, how come you so rarely talk about the Holocaust? And he stiffened, which is something he rarely did. And he said, Martin... The Nazis took five years from my life. I won't give them one minute more. Martin, never look back. Always take the next step forward. And that's a long-winded but hopefully helpful way to remind you that even when somebody has had something as bad as the Holocaust, what helped him and many of the other Holocaust survivors I got to know move forward was not going to Holocaust remembrances, not revisiting it. The ones that were happier human beings with those who followed my father's advice, never look back, always take the next step forward. And one more thing I want to say. I've had, like I said, over 6,000, almost 6,000 clients. And that is one of the big differentiating features of my, of my successful clients versus not. The successful ones are far more likely to have followed my advice. Stop looking back. Always take the next step forward. In any event, uh, uh, this is Marty Nemco reminding you that we find comfort among those who agree with us growth among those who don't.